Well, I've got issues. And in honest, we all have issues. We got them. We 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 put them in corners. We tuck it, you know, underneath the pillow, or sometimes leave it in the closet. But we have them. Uh, and Dr. Phil, who will be joining me in a conversation uh, in this episode of the podcast, I'm really excited uh, about uh, having him on to talk about his new book, We've Got Issues, How You Can Stand Strong for America's Soul and Sanity. Uh, Philip McGraw, PhD, we know and love him as Dr. Phil, is the author of 10 New York Times bestsellers, in 2023, after 21 seasons of dominating the genre, Dr. Phil chose to end his daytime platform uh, in order to launch his own broadcast cable television network, Merritt Street Media, which will be popping uh, on the air beginning in about a month. He joins me to discuss his new book. As I've said, we get into faith, religion, uh, personal responsibility, uh, and a whole host of other things that aggravate, inform, and can help us deal with our issues. Coming up next on the Michael Steele Podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Michael Steele Podcast. Well, I have to tell you, this one is a real spe special treat uh, for me because I've watched uh, my next guest. I've read his works. Uh, I particularly loved his scenes on in Tyler Perry movies. Uh, just, just a, a big fan, <laughs> a big fan there. That scene with Medea was just—it's priceless, comedy, comedy gold. Doctor Phil, welcome to the podcast, my friend. Hey, thank you so much for having me on. And I got to tell you, there was a lot of Oscar buzz around that uh, Medea movie. I don't, I don't know what happened. We, we were counting on a nomination. It didn't come through. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's just sometimes people just in the moment, they just don't understand what they see in yeah. front of them. So <laughs> I guess that's it. <laughs> well, it's it's a real pleasure to have you on uh, mm -hmm. to talk about your, your latest work, um, which, you know, really, I, I think goes to the heart of a lot of the conversations Americans are having today <clears throat> uh, around, uh, you know, questions on who we are, what we believe, uh, why are people behaving the way they're behaving? As my mom used to say, why are people showing their ass that way? Um, and and, and you, you're, <clears throat> we've got issues really kind of sums it up because we do. Um, we have a lot of issues, a lot of them unresolved, a lot of them we don't want to resolve, uh, and a lot of them we just want to stew in. Uh, how, what, what was the motivation behind this particular work as you looked out um, <clears throat> across the landscape and saw how America was evolving? You know, that's, that's such a great question. And I, I promise not to ramble because I could talk about <laughs> that answer for <laughs> an hour. But, um, you know, I, I, I didn't plan uh, to write a book right now, but I did exactly what you're saying, and that is to kind of look around. And... I was really concerned about what I'm seeing happening uh, in America right now. Uh, just real frankly, I, I, I see um, a lot of the values that I think have defined our country um, kind of getting pushed to the side. I, I see a lot of people trying to hijack the merit, the, the narrative that <clears throat> defines America and I, I want to start out by saying I love this country. I, yeah. I absolutely love this country. I I stand up when the flag goes by. I put my hand over my heart when they play the national anthem, and uh, I'm I'm really proud to be an American. And I'm and I think we're in a real bad bad place when you get criticized for saying you love your country. Yeah. But you're just going to have to criticize me because I do. Is is this a perfect country? Of course not. We. That's why I titled the book. We've got issues. We do, but there are things we can, the things we can work on, and we should work on. But when I hear people um, out there that are talking about things that I consider to be terribly counterproductive, things that I consider to be insanity, and I'll give you some examples of exactly what I mean. Um, when I see what I consider to be an attack on the American family, 
which I think is the backbone of any society, including mm-hmm. ours, uh, then I think it's time to step up and speak up. And, you know, the subtitle of this book is How You Can Stand Strong for America's Soul and Sanity, because this is really uh, a prescriptive book. This is a how-to book. This mm-hmm. is a manual on how to do. I hate people that come along and criticize and don't have a better plan. Anybody can criticize it. But, I live in that world, Dr. Phil. I live in that well, world. <laughs> you know, Sam, Sam Raymond, former Texas Speaker of the House, said any jackass can kick down a barn, but it takes a carpenter to build one. Yeah. And I want to be a carpenter. I don't want to just complain about what's going on. And in in the book, I, I talk about 10 principles that I think are critical for the success and survival of any society and and I talk about how they apply and 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 what we need to do but like for example I, I think that um, yeah right now I see what's happening in a lot of the colleges and I've spoken out about that I, I think we we're preparing our next generation uh, with this equality of outcome uh, narrative and let me tell you that's not how it works mm-hmm. uh, we got colleges out there that are coddling an entire generation that we're going to turn this country over to. Uh, For example, uh, over 70% of colleges use trigger warnings uh, where they're um, alerting students to what may be upsetting material. Well, you know what? You don't get that in the real world. No, you don't. You don't get you don't get somebody that comes into work and says, well, now today there may be some things that upset you, so you can go sit in this room over here. That's not how it works. And here's what bothers me, Michael. In, when, you, when you look at an example of trigger warnings, which is a, a really good example, they don't work. Right. Trigger warnings don't work. In fact, they create the very anxiety right. and, and panic attacks <laughs> that they're trying to alert students to. And uh, the, the fact that they don't work is th- the literature is replete with studies that say they don't work. And the universities that are using them have access to the same research that I do, which says they don't work. <laughs> so why are they using them when they damn well know they don't work? I'll tell you why, because they're virtue signaling. They're out there trying to say, oh, look how sensitive we are. Look, look look how dialed in we are. Ignore the fact that they don't work. And they talk about uh, trying to get uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and they've, they've disallowed use of the SAT. The research is very clear. The SAT is a pole vault for kids in low socioeconomic areas, inner city areas, uh, minority groups, it's the one thing that can pole vault them out of there when they don't have the GPA or they don't have the curriculums to get them out of there. The research is very clear. This is the one thing that will take some of those children out of those areas and put them into the best schools, but they don't use them. And I have research that says, yes, we know that they work, but we don't want to use them because we'll get criticized. Well, it's, it speaks to the sort of the broader question because, you know, a lot of a lot of the questions I have around some of the things I see happening on college campuses, uh, for example, in, in the example you just gave, is like, what are you preparing these kids for? I mean, because if, if, you're, if, if you're trying to give them a safe space to operate in, tell me once they graduate this fine institution, what safe space are they going to find in their homes, their businesses, their community, that they can go chill out and not have anyone bombard them with things that they are hypersensitive to. And and I just often wondered, what are we preparing the next generation for? We, we've pared back how we educate them. We pared back how we socialize them. We've pared back how we arm them um, rhetorically or otherwise for the challenges of just being alive. And then you couple on top of that real life things that they have to deal with that we don't want to deal, want to confront, whether it's, you know, how they're perceived and and received uh, by uh, police and other authorities in their communities, 
how banks and business owners work or don't work with them. So you see this, you know, oh, we want to create a safe space, but at the same time, disarm you for actually what you need to confront in the world. Well, you, you, I couldn't have said it better. In fact, I'm going to steal that and use it when you're not around. Uh, <laughs> you are that's welcome, very sir. Well, <laughs> that's very well said, because our job as parents is to prepare our children for the next level of life, right? Yeah. And our job as educators is to prepare our students for the next level of their career. And if we aren't teaching them what they need to do to be competitive in the marketplace, then they're going to be coming back saying, what the hell did I pay you all this money for? And here's the hypocrisy of it. You go pay all of this money, quarter million dollars for an elite education at Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, UCLA, USC, uh, whatever. And then you get in there and they teach you, well, the goal here is we should have a quality of outcome. Well, Really? Then why am I paying you a quarter million dollars for this elite education? If I'm going to get the same thing as a guy sitting home in a beanbag eating Cheetos, what the hell am I down here paying you a quarter million dollars for an elite education? And then you teach me we're all going to have the same thing. I think I'll just go get in a beanbag and eat the right. Cheetos. Exactly. Exactly. And I and you'll put that quarter million dollars into something else other than your institution. And, exactly. And and they're getting all this student debt. And, you know, the, Harvard has $56 billion endowment. And when it comes time to say, oh, we got all this problem with student debt, you notice all of a sudden you can't find those guys with both hands. All of a sudden, they what do they have to say about it? Oh, they're not here. They, they don't have anything to say. They're they're busy. They're busy administrating. And, they, and some of these schools have three to one administrators per student. Yep. Are you kidding me? Yeah, yeah. How about we get somebody to teach these kids instead of <laughs> over here administrating? It's ridiculous what's going on. Well, it's it's so funny you say. I just had a flashback to when I was lieutenant governor and uh, I had uh, embraced uh, education as a former. I mean, I taught for a short term when I was uh, in the seminary with the Augustinians, and that opened my eyes to a lot of things. So when I became an elected official, I wanted to really get into education. And one of the things I found out found out very quickly when I looked at our university system is that we had more vice presidents <laughs> per student. I'm like, what the hell do all these people do? I mean, how a vice, I mean, how many vice exactly. presidents have vice presidents? What are you what are you talking about? And then you <clears throat> wonder why even as state institutions <clears throat> have to fill tuitions yeah. are, are becoming difficult for families. And you know what they don't have anymore? They don't have vice president of admissions because <laughs> they don't use the word admissions office anymore because it might imply that someone is going to be rejected yes. and they can't use that anymore because that hurts somebody's feelings. So now they call it office of enrollment management. Just like in the justice system, we don't have felons anymore. We have justice-involved individuals. Right, right. Hey. They can't call them felons anymore. So, if your family member gets raped, they they weren't they weren't victimized by a rapist. They intersected with a justice-involved individual. I kid you not. It's. I'm I'm sitting here looking at myself, thinking, did I wake up in the twilight zone? Yes. <laughs> I, I, we're so sensitive. We got this list of words we can't use. We got this over-inclusive language that we're supposed to use. And I'm not just talking about pronouns. Don't get me started on that because 30% of fifth and eighth graders cannot read a simple sentence. They don't know what a pronoun oh, now is. is. Right, right, right. I think we should focus on them learning how to read before we start getting into a pronoun. Uh, so I, I, I just, I'm, I'm looking at this thinking somebody needs to step up and say, what happened to common sense? And let's get back to rewarding the things we want to see more of and not rewarding the things we don't want to see more of. Uh, and that's my number two principle for a healthy society is 
Number three is don't reward bad behavior. Yeah. Don't reward bad behavior or things you don't want to see. Don't support things you don't want to see more of. Yeah. Uh, I, I just think that we've lost our way and we've got this, I call it tyranny of the fringe. We got these fringe factions on both sides. You know, on the right, they're out in the woods with rifles uh, shooting the limbs off trees. On the right. left, we've, we've got all of these activists that are trying to force an agenda on people that they don't want. And we got all these people in the middle saying, hey, I've always been live and let live, live and let live. Well, I get that. And I, I, I love that people are willing to do that, but there comes a time. My, my grandmother used to say, you, 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 you quit preaching and gone to meddling. Now you, <laughs> you, you, you start interfering. You start interfering. Now we need to, we need to stand up and say something. And these are the things that I'm talking about in the book. I mean, you can't stay silent just so other people will not be upset. They need to get upset. Because we're going to speak up, we're going to start talking common sense and getting back to things that matter. I, I think that's an I think that's such an important uh, inflection point. In fact, I I have a speech that I I give to national audiences that I asked to appear before, um, and just recently uh, gave a version of it at the principal principal's first conference here in Washington a couple of weeks ago, in which I entitled it "In Defense of Common Sense." doing those things your mama told you to do because guess what <laughs> they were the common sense things to do uh, but we've exactly moved, we've moved away from that in such a, a in such a dramatic way you you start in fact and I, I i was very intrigued particularly coming out of the political space so you know whenever i see a poll my antenna go up and I, i'm like okay what, what what are we digging in on here but you start each chapter of the book with a polling question and and some of those Questions include things like, how often do you feel that you're being told the truth by an assigned authority, uh, an unelected government official, such as the head of the of an agency, uh, or once you haven't uh, formed an opinion about something of importance, how likely are you to resist or revisit that opinion and seek out or seriously consider new information? What did you learn from this type of polling, from the <clears throat> polling that you did, um, and do you think these questions were important, not just um, uh, to inform your writing of the book, but for us to understand more fully our own pathologies <laughs> with respect to the issues? Well, we <laughs> well uh, both, but especially I, I wanted people to know. Here's how I compare to other people. And it's not that there's a right or wrong answer, but let, let's say I'm going to my Sunday school class on a Sunday morning. And I'm sitting there thinking that I don't feel comfortable speaking up. Right. Um, and I, I, I worry about criticism if I speak up. If I know that 75% of the other people that were polled also feel that way, then maybe I could go in there and say, hey, guys, um, I saw this poll uh, in in Dr. Phil's book that said three out of four people are uncomfortable speaking up about something. Is that true? There's 20 people in this room. Do 15 of you feel that way? Because if you do, raise your hand because I feel pretty alone over here. And if if that's true, then maybe a conversation can start and say, yeah. You know, I, I don't have to worry about being canceled. Uh, and, you know, I, someone smarter than me said, um, I, I would rather have questions I can't answer than answers I can't question. And right now, that's where we are. We have answers we can't question because if we raise our hand and say, wait a minute, I, I, can I ask some questions about that? Oh, no. All of a sudden, you're a hater. You're you're some kind oh, that's of what happens. You're, yeah, you, you can't even ask questions uh, because they say, "Oh, okay. Well, obviously, you're, you're a hater. You're you're not somebody that we want to be around." Well, we ought to be able to ask questions. God forbid, disagree. Right. Um, and we've got to be able to have an intelligent conversation. And if you realize that seventy-five percent of the people said they they agree or strongly agree 
that they <clears throat> don't feel comfortable speaking up, then maybe you realize, hey, I'm not alone in this. If we all share that and admit it, then maybe we could actually have an intelligent conversation. What, what and is, I think that's important. What do, I was going to say, just drawing that out a little bit, what for you um, would be some of the things you like to see us begin to have that intelligent conversation about? Well, for example, um, <clears throat> I, I think I think it's really important that we get back to recognizing hard work, talent, and contribution, and get away from putting people in situations where they depend on the government to get by. Mm. Uh, we have we have too much victimology, victimhood, victim thinking in this country, and I, I saw it happen in COVID. Um, you know, in, in COVID, the government spent, and it depends on how you measure it, so people can fact check me on this, but I think they'll find I'm pretty close to the number here, but the government spent $5.5 .5 trillion All right. yeah. um, during COVID in you know putting out bonus payments and extending unemployment and mortgage forgiveness, rent mm -hmm. forgiveness, all of this, $5.5 trillion. Um, we found out that $4.4 .4 trillion of that went into savings or checking accounts, which means the people didn't need it for groceries and rent right then, or they wouldn't have tucked it away. Um, and, you know, if you start taking care of people, if you start paying them not to work, then guess what? They're going to quit working. If you pay somebody more money to sit at home than to work, then psychology has taught me that you're rewarding the wrong behaviors. And what happens, everybody thought when COVID was over, you remember that scene from the movie Grease when mm -hmm. it's all over and the doors fly open and they all come running out to the carnival. Right. Everybody thought that's what it's going to be like when COVID was over. That's not what happened because what happened was people got used to not working and their world got smaller and they adjusted to less income and a, 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 a smaller world. They got by with one car. Maybe they went to a little smaller house or apartment and they adjusted their life to that. And now what they used to take for granted with what they did, whether they were a welder's helper or a nurse or whatever, uh, that looked kind of intimidating to them now because they got out of practice. They but got you, out of the habit. So and so for, for you, that would explain why so many people uh, in terms of looking at their jobs and looking at the jobs they were doing decided – I don't need to go back to that. I don't need, I mean, because I, I had a couple of buddies who just, I mean, they just stopped work. And I'm just like, well, what are you going to do with your <laughs> your mortgage in, in three really? months? You know, um, it was like, oh, you know, it'll work out. I'm like, well, you know, those government, that $1,200 you got, ain't, you're not getting that in, you know, forever. But it, it turned, it opened up a spigot for some folks in a way that I think kind of changed the way they looked at their situation. Yeah, I, t I talked about I talk about in the book. Uh, we've got issues that I, I, part of my training in psychology is in medical psychology or behavioral medicine, and we observe with people that are in rehab, not drug rehab, but mm -hmm. you know they, they've been injured. They're having to do spinal rehabilitation, relearn certain things if they've been injured on the job. That the longer they stay out, the less likely they are to return. To full time gainful employment. And I mean, it's a straight line correlation that if they're out for three months, their likelihood of returning uh, is much higher than if they're out for nine months because they adapt to not working. Their peer group becomes patients uh, instead of buddies that they right. worked with or girlfriends that they go to lunch with at, at work. Um, they're their activities become going to the doctor, going to rehab. Just, I mean, everything changes. They get a new peer group. They get new activities. They get a new orbit that they 
circle around in and they don't get up in the morning and take a shower and get dressed and get out. They sit in their pajamas all day. And what happened is we had people staying home, living off of these programs. And then when COVID was over, nobody wanted to go back to work. And then they wondered, well, what happened to the supply chain? Why can't we get these, <laughs> these boats unloaded out in the harbor off of Long Beach? Well, they were backed up for miles out there yeah. and they couldn't get anybody to unload them. They couldn't get anybody to put them on trucks. They couldn't get anybody to drive the True. trucks. They couldn't get anybody to work at the hotels and in, you know, in hospitality because they could make more money at home. Gas was $7 a gallon. They thought, you know, I, the, the commute is costing me 200 bucks a week. I can stay home. Don't have to pay that. Uh, and so you you pay people to do the wrong things and then wonder why uh, the country is paralyzed and wonder why we're in inflation, wonder why we have shortages of everything. And I'm, I, I'm watching this and, and sitting back thinking, are you, are, are, are you people crazy? You, you, you pay people to not work and then say, I wonder why we can't get anybody to work. Really? Well, and it, it's interesting though because I, you know, at least initially, I don't think it was the idea of paying people not to work. It was like, okay, we'll just pay them to, uh, you know, we'll get through this tough part. But then the second round of it, given all the other observable evidence that was beginning to pile up, like you were just mentioning, you would think that <clears throat> someone would say, uh, "Excuse me." Uh, <laughs> Do we really want to do that? I mean, it goes to how the society reopened itself too, because even that was ham-handed and 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 not done in a in a way that was actually encouraging people to better behavior, but actually set up more conflict and and consternation, which again sort of fed a mindset that started to form in in many respects with how they looked at their their jobs and the and the larger society and certainly the role the government played in COVID and all of that. Well, you know, we mismanaged COVID so bad. It, it's, I mean, you could have stopped cars on the highway at random and taken the first 10 people and put them in charge. I think we could have done better, but yet we've paid billions of dollars to these agencies to be ready in these emergencies. And when they shut the schools down for a couple of weeks, I said, I, I get it. I, I get it. This is a new virus. We don't know what's going to happen. Right. Um, but then when they said, well, we're just going to shut down for the rest of the school year. And then they said, we're not going to open back up in the fall. I, I, in a lot of states, I said, I, I, I went on the air. I, I'm not saying this after the fact. I went on the air at the time and said, this is a big mistake, guys. The, this prolonged quarantine is going to create more damage to these children than the virus ever would. We we know real early on that children are not highly susceptible to any serious damage from this virus. Right. Uh, well, what about the teachers? Well, you know, first responders are working. Grocery store people are working. Nurses at the hospitals are working. Uh, you're saying mask and social distancing. We, these teachers can work. Um, and if you put these kids on remote learning, particularly uh, in the inner city and particularly in the low right. socioeconomic, they're going to have such a gap. And when I went out and said all of that, uh, people attacked me. Oh, you got like, lit up. <laughs> I oh, my God. Yeah. And <laughs> you, got you also... You also notice I did not take one step backwards. No, you didn't. I doubled down and said, I, you'd say what you want, but you, and uh, ask me how many people have called since and said, hey, you were right, we were wrong. Zero, Zero. yeah. Zero, yeah. although I was right, they were wrong. <laughs> um, and and what's happened is these kids the people that did this are the same people that keep records that knew these kids were in the, the biggest mental health crisis since records have been kept. Yeah. The highest levels of, of 
anxiety, depression, loneliness, suicidal ideation, and suicidality since records have been kept. That obtained in 09 and 10. And it just kept getting worse until COVID. And then it just really went up. Okay, so what's important for kids like that? You got to keep them involved, keep them engaged, give them an opportunity to achieve, have them interacting with peers, make sure they're out there moving ahead. You can't get ahead if you're not swinging. You got to keep them out there. Right. And they yank their support system out from under them. And in addition to that, you've got all of these kids that are subject to abuse and sexual molestation, et cetera, at home. And when you shut those schools down, mandated reporters did not have their eyes on those kids and referrals to DCFS and Child Protective Services dropped in some instances as much as 50%. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that the abuse dropped 50%. What we did is we sent them home and locked them up behind closed doors with their abusers with nobody to run interference for these kids. We abandoned them to their abusers. Right. And so these kids just got, some of them got their meals, two days, two meals a day from the school, shut that down. Uh, They were getting their reinforcement from the school, shut that down. Abusers, uh, abused children, molested children were getting protection from mandate reporters, shut that down. Uh, Nobody ever talked about that. I did. And they looked at me like I was insane. Uh, And now we've got this, a terrible emotional, social, developmental gap, educational achievement gap, and it hasn't been closed. Some efforts are being made to close it, but not enough. And what's and what's important about what you just said, Dr. Phil, is that that is that is demonstrable. I mean, the spike is obvious, um, and you can track it r- compared to uh, you know a three year span prior to COVID. And the three years of COVID, and then what happened, what we're going through right now, you can actually see what you're talking about, um, you know, graphically, because it's it's it is that stark uh, in terms of yeah. how this period impacted this generation of kids and their ability to learn, socialize, uh, and actually, you know, figure out how to be productive members of society. I want to take a quick break. When I come back, I want to I want to chat with you about uh, a a very important part of the book uh, as I was reading it and was really one, I was really interested in the way you dove into uh, religion and the family and the consequences uh, that flow from that. The book is a great one, folks. We've got issues, how you can stand strong for America's soul and sanity. It is written by none other than Dr. Phil, uh, Dr. Phil McGraw, Philip McGraw to be. Uh, particular about it, but we know and love him as Dr. Phil. We're going to take a quick break. and When we come back, we'll have more with Dr. Phil right after this. Welcome back, everybody. Michael Steele podcast. Um, Great conversation uh, this afternoon with Dr. Phil, who's got a new book, your 10th book, I I believe you said. uh, (laughs) And and of course, we were talking before. He says, I wouldn't plan to write another book. (laughs) But no, it's right too now. much work. <laughs> but it's a good work. one, folks. It's worth it's worth the read. Uh, as I told Dr. Phil before we started our conversation, I found myself talking to myself in response to what he'd written in the book. Uh, we've got issues how you can stand strong for America's soul and sanity. Um, I was particularly interested in uh, a couple of things and, and narratives that you were able to create in the book um, around. Uh, religion uh, and spirituality, the family, um, your your thinking around why so many Americans have become disillusioned um, uh, with religion and spirituality. Uh, You note, uh, for example, quote, the decline of religion's influence on society has led to divorce and cohabitation becoming more acceptable. Divorce and cohabitation becoming more acceptable leads to fewer later marriages Fewer later marriages mean fewer children. Fewer children leads to less organized religion, membership, and attendance. And less organized religion combined with more children of divorce means fewer marriages. And around and around and around we go. Uh, and 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 you 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 feed that out um, quite a bit. What talk to me a little bit about this disillusionment that you have. Uh, pegged into with religion and spirituality, and how that has been. <clears throat> 
an important impact on uh, the family um, and and culturally uh, our grip with dealing with some of the the pathologies again that that feed this this uh, illness that we have these issues that we have. Well, it's a it's a big factor in my view, and I don't care you know what religion you uh, ascribe to. What I'm talking about is that for the first time in our country's history, um, religion, um, people's participation in organized religion has dropped below 50%. For the first time um, in our 250 plus year history uh, in this country, um, it's it's dropped below the 50% mark. And uh, whether you want to think about religion or, or whether you don't, the, the statistics um, are undeniable. And it the reason I say that there's a circular pattern there is that we know that if you're involved in uh, organized religion, for example, the, the birth rate, fertility rate, uh, for those in the childbearing years is 2.1. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're not, it's 1.3. Now, why is that important? Well, in order for us to sustain this country and the infrastructure that makes it work, we have to have a 2.1 birth rate. At 1.3, we don't have enough people coming along to support the infrastructure. I mean, all the social security and all the things mm-hmm. that keep this country going, we don't have the people. Um, we also know that the divorce rate is 50% less among people that attend church on a regular basis. <clears throat> now, I, I don't know, you can debate why that is, but you can't debate that it is because that's a fact. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe it's because they don't want to get divorced and be judged. Maybe it's because they find peace in church. Whatever the reason, it's 50% of those that never go through the church doors. Um, and I think there are a couple of things to explain why we've got this drop off. I think there's a lot of competition, uh, for people's time and energy. Now the birth rate has dropped to 1.6. And the reason most people join church is they want to have their children raised in the church, want to have them christened or baptized. Mm -hmm. So fewer children, fewer people are joining the church. Uh, so it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, and it, it's it, it's a problem that we're either going to consciously address or it's going to continue to erode. It's projected to continue down over the next 50 years. And that's going to really hurt our society and, and hurt our families. Um, I think part of the problem is churches are not adapting. You know, the job of the church is to meet the people where they are. It's not the job of the people to meet the church where they expect them to be. You've got to find the people, meet them where they are. I mean, if they're out in the park, then take church to the park. Yeah. If they're all watching the NFL on Sunday morning, then you better have church in the afternoon, or you better have it on Saturday afternoon, something. Mm-hmm. you got to meet the people where they are, and because this is an important element of society. Um, and I, I just think if we'll get the churches to not be so staid in the way they do things and recognize that they've got to meet potential parishioners where they are. And maybe it's changing how you do it for young people or whatever. We've just got to adapt. And, but, but I think it's worth doing because uh, it brings about so many positives uh, for our society. And, it, you know, and I'm not just Bible thumping here. If if you can come up with some other way that creates those same positive effects on our culture and society, right. tell me what it is. But we know that organized religion does. And a lot of people are turned off of it because of the hypocrisy of, you know, the Catholic Church and all the scandals that they've had and uh, what people see in some of the other churches as well. But I'm just telling you, it makes a big difference for the family unit and the cohesiveness of the family unit. It makes a difference for things like birth rate and the family staying together. So there are big positives, 
and everybody involved needs to work on it. You know, consciously uh, choose to be involved, and the churches need to do a better job of reaching out to the people. How do you how do you manage, Doctor Phil, the the intersection of politics and faith, religion, church institutions, um, particularly as you see, you know, as a, as a as a Catholic, uh, as a former uh, member of the Augustinian order uh, in my years in seminary. Um, you know, I, I see it and know it from that, from that side of it, um, as well as from the lay side. Um, and, and, and how politics and culture and other, uh, things impact the institution and the behavior of the institution itself, particularly as its leaders impact, uh, all of that. How do you, how do you, because I agree fundamentally with what you're saying, but then I'm then I'm sitting and I'm I'm looking at what I just described in my faith that I'm seeing in my among my evangelical friends this rise of Christian nationalism and what that may or may not portend for uh, exactly what you're talking about, where pastors are more driven about the political ideology than the than the teachings of. Jesus himself. When I'm reading in Newsweek, evangelical pastors saying that they no longer want to follow the teachings of Christ because they're too, quote, woke. I'm like, dude, what what the hell are you talking about? Okay, I'm not going to church with you on Sunday because I don't want any lightning to strike me. But you, you see what I'm saying? You've got where the at there I think you could argue at one point, Dr. Phil, that faith and morals and uh, those fundamental things, those common sense things, drove and informed our politics, our culture, um, how we educated, how we did business. Today, and, and certainly our politics, but today our, it seems our politics are driving all those other things. Our affiliation matters more than than anything else. You know, my tribe is better than your tribe, uh, and that translates um, into what church looks like on Sunday morning. Well, I'm so glad to hear you say that and and describe it that way because politics and religion should be so separate. And yes, you know, right now everybody thinks that. Republican conservatives are evangelical and and maybe it's because of the abortion issue or whatever, but they they do they have politicized this. And uh, to me, now you know you have the the Catholic background. Uh, I was born into the Baptist Church uh, and was was raised in in the Baptist Church. And you know they were they were very uh, conservative, and it was in you know Oklahoma and Texas, so you mm-hmm. can imagine that's the buckle of the Bible Belt, right? Uh, but you know what I learned is that my relationship was with Jesus Christ. My relationship was with our Father God. It wasn't with the church. Right. It wasn't with the people running the church. And so the relationship I had was personal. It wasn't with the group. And I didn't care about the group's politics. Um, We just went down there as part of the group. But my relationship was very personal. Mm -hmm. And politics, uh, the, the, the group think, had very little to do with it to this very day. And uh, I had a friend that used to say, I, I love the Lord, it's Christians I can't stand. And <laughs> I, I always thought, you know, you, you're, you're being a little harsh. We all have flaws, but uh, he, he was adamant about it. And I always thought, doesn't affect me because it, it's a very, I think religion is, is personal. And yes. I, I, don't, I don't care what somebody's politics are. And if they get up and start talking politics, uh, I, I put my earbuds in and I, you know, I start listening to <laughs> some good gospel music. You know? There you go. Um, but I, I do think you can find every reason in the world 
to let somebody come between you and God, you and Jesus Christ, you and uh, your higher power, whatever you choose to call it. And those are those are excuses. They're not reasons. You still have to have you, you got to own your relationship. Yep. And 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 that is a one on one sort of thing. I, and I, I I really encourage people. And maybe the church you're in is not for you. Um, I, I I had to give a, a a talk one time at at our church uh, back when we were living in Dallas the first time, and I always talk to people about you know are you being spiritually fed? If 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 you're being spiritually fed, then you're in a good place. If it's spiritually barren for you, if yeah. you're not getting addressed spiritually then you need to ask yourself what you need to do mm-hmm. to be spiritually fed. If you can't answer that question, then you need to start looking for somewhere you can, but look to yourself first. It's yeah. your job to get along with God. It's not God's job to get along with you. And we've got too much of that attitude today. It's like, it's not the professor's job to get along with the student. It's the student's <laughs> job to get along with the professor. It's not God's job to get along with you. It's your job to get along get with along. God. That's right. And, <laughs> and I've always I've always adhered to that, and I, I think if people would recognize that you create your own experience, right? It's what yep. you make of it, and it and uh, sure, I, I I saw guys that in the Baptist church when I was thirteen years old that uh, were hypocritical as they could be. They'd go outside and smoke between uh, Sunday school and church and use foul language and dirty jokes, talk about getting drunk tonight for all Baptist no-nos and then go in and be totally pious. Well, I could use that as an excuse, uh, but that's what it is. It's just an excuse. That has nothing to do with my relationship. And I I think people hide behind that sometimes. Yeah. That is so well, well put because that's exactly what happened. You know, as we, as we wind down the conversation, it is that, idea uh that i think permeates your book um in sort of dealing with the fact that we have these issues it really begins with us it doesn't begin with you coming correct to me it's how i come correct how i begin to address those those things that are so important you know my principle number one in the book is be who you are on purpose yeah be who you are on purpose. Live with intention. You're not a victim. You create your own experience. Be who you are on purpose. And I'm so glad you brought up the religious thing because that's that's where it begins. I, I, your relationship um, with your higher power is up to you. Be who you are on purpose. Do it on purpose. You don't have, need to blame somebody else. Whatever you create is up to you. I promise the Lord never moves. He's always there. He's open 24 <laughs> seven. Dr. Phil, <laughs> we're going to leave it on that tip right there. <laughs> Man, good I place think, to stop. A good place to stop. It was such a treat uh, to have you share. Uh, I think some important insights. Uh, as I said, folks, this is, this is a good book. It is, it is one that I guarantee you, you will talk to yourself out loud <laughs> when you're reading it, because, you know, I'll say it, I, you you provoke and you you dare in a way that um, makes makes for a good, healthy challenge. And I think to the last point you were making, a lot of us don't want to because it requires us to confront ourselves first. It's easy to go after Dr. Phil, and I can yeah. put all my baggage on Dr. Phil. And he's going to look at me like I'm crazy because he's like, well, that ain't my issue. <laughs> That's your issue. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, this this book is meant to unify. It's it's meant to get people to look to themselves and uh, and help close the divide. And, and But it begins with the individual and then the collective personality of the family, the community, the state, the nation. And um, it's it, that's what I wrote it for. And I think we can uh, create our own our own destiny going forward. So I thank you for taking the time to talk to me about it, Mike. Absolutely. It means an awful lot. No, it means a lot to me, sir. And I, I've I've always been a fan and followed your work. 
Um, love the show um, and all the stuff that you've done publicly and the conversations you've had because at every turn, you've always made us think. Um, and this book, even though it was not planned, uh, it's here for a reason and has a purpose. And I would encourage everyone, pick up a copy of We Got Issues, How You Can Stand Strong for America's Soul and Sanity. The author is Dr. Phil C. McGraw. We know and love him as Dr. Phil. Thanks again for being on the podcast, my friend. Well, I appreciate it. And the book is going to be the kind of blueprint for the new network that I'm launching on April 2nd called Merritt Street Media. And you'll be able to find it everywhere you get a TV signal, cable, streamers, uh, fast awesome. channels, terrestrial, 24-7 uh, network. Uh, uh, beginning on April 2nd. So I hope everybody will tune in to be Dr. Phil primetime and uh, we'll have news every day and a whole lot of other things. So oh, Merritt, Street, Merritt Street Media. Well, you you have your folks with that. When that's all set and ready to go, send me some you know links. I'll put it all over my social media and broadcast it along with uh, uh, the book itself as we will from, from this interview. But certainly... Uh, since that's just a few weeks away, that's it's good a good window to get all that done. So I'm happy to Great. help you as well. All right, folks. Thank that, you so that, much. Oh no, thank you, Doc. It, absolutely appreciate it. That does it for our time together, folks. You know what I always say: do the download thing. It makes me feel all yummy inside. I appreciate it. Uh, don't forget to check us out. Uh, you can check out Doctor Phil on Twitter X at Doctor Phil. Um, and certainly give us a, a, a little bit of love to at Michael Steele and at Steele underscore podcast. Until next time, be safe, be well, God bless.